Book One, Chapter Eleven of A Hero of Our Time by Mikhail Yurovich Lermontov, translated by Mar Murray and J. H. Wisdom. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. A crowd was awaiting us at the fortress gate. Carefully we carried the wounded girl to Pechorin's quarters, and then we sent for the doctor. The latter was drunk, but he came examined the wound, and announced that she could not live more than a day. He was mistaken, though. She recovered? I asked the staff captain, seizing him by the arm and involuntarily rejoicing. No, he replied, but the doctor was so far mistaken that she lived two days longer. Explain, though, how Kazbich made off with her. It was like this. In spite of Pechorin's prohibition, she went out of the fortress and down to the river. It was a very hot day, you know, and she sat on a rock and dipped her feet in the water. Up crept Kazbich, pounced upon her, silenced her, and dragged her into the bushes. Then he sprang on his horse and made off. In the meantime she succeeded in crying out. The sentries took the alarm, fired, but wide of the mark, and thereupon we arrived on the scene. But what did Kazbich want to carry her off for? Good gracious! Why, everyone knows these Circassians are a race of thieves. They can't keep their hands off anything that is left lying about. They may not want a thing, but they will steal it for all that. Still, you mustn't be too hard on them. And besides, he had been in love with her for a long time. Then Bella died? Yes, she died. But she suffered for a long time. And we were fairly knocked up with her, I can tell you. About ten o'clock in the evening she came to herself. We were sitting by her bed. As soon as ever she opened her eyes, she began to call Pechorin. "'I am here beside you, my Jenechka, that is, my darling,' he answered, taking her by the hand. "'I shall die,' she said. We began to comfort her, telling her that the doctor had promised infallibly to cure her. She shook her little head and turned to the wall. She did not want to die. At night she became delirious, her head burned, at times a feverish paroxysm convulsed her whole body. She talked incoherently about her father, her brother. She yearned for the mountains, for her home. Then she spoke of Pechorin also, called him various fond names, or approached him for having ceased to love his Jenechka. He listened to her in silence, his head sunk in his hands. But yet, during the whole time, I did not notice a single teardrop on his lashes. I do not know whether he was actually unable to weep or was mastering himself. For my part, I have never seen anything more pitiful. Towards morning the delirium passed off. For an hour or so she lay motionless, pale, and so weak that it was hardly possible to observe that she was breathing. After that she grew better and began to talk. Only about what, do you think? Such thoughts come only to the dying. She lamented that she was not a Christian, that in the other world her soul would never meet the soul of Grigory Alexandrovich, and that in paradise another woman would be his companion. The thought occurred to me to baptize her before her death. I told her my idea. She looked at me undecidedly, and for a long time was unable to utter a word. Finally she answered that she would die in the faith in which she had been born. A whole day passed thus. What a change that day made in her. Her pale cheeks fell in, her eyes grew ever so large, her lips burned. She felt a consuming heat within her, as though a red-hot blade was piercing her breast. The second night came on. We did not close our eyes or leave the bedside. She suffered terribly and groaned, and directly the pain began to abate she endeavored to assure Grigory Alexandrovitch that she felt better, and tried to persuade him to go to bed, kissed his hand, and would not let it out of hers. Before the morning she began to feel the death agony and to toss about. She knocked the bandage off, and the blood flowed afresh. When the wound was bound up again, she grew quiet for a moment, and begged Pechorin to kiss her. He fell on his knees beside the bed, raised her head from the pillow, and pressed his lips to hers. 
which were growing cold. She threw her trembling arms closely round his neck, as if with that kiss she wished to yield up her soul to him. No, she did well to die. Why, what would have become of her if Grigory Alexandrovitch had abandoned her? And that is what would have happened sooner or later. During half the following day she was calm, silent, and docile, however much the doctor tortured her with his fomentations and mixtures. Good heavens, I said to him, you know you said yourself that she was certain to die. So what is the good of all these preparations of yours? Even so, it is better to do all this, he replied, so that I may have an easy conscience. A pretty conscience, forsooth. After midday, Bella began to suffer from thirst. We opened the windows, but it was hotter outside than in the room. We placed ice round the bed, all to no purpose. I knew that that intolerable thirst was a sign of the approaching end, and I told Pichorin so. "'Water! Water!' she said in a hoarse voice, raising herself up from the bed. Pichorin turned pale as a sheet, seized a glass, filled it, and gave it to her. I covered my eyes with my hands and began to say a prayer. I can't remember what. Yes, my friend, many a time have I seen people die in hospitals or on the field of battle, but this was something altogether different. Still, this one thing grieves me. I must confess, she died without even once calling me to mind. Yet I loved her, I should think, like a father. Well, God forgive her, and to tell the truth, what am I that she should have remembered me when she was dying? As soon as she had drunk the water, she grew easier, but in about three minutes she breathed her last. We put a looking-glass to her lips. It was undimmed. I led Pechorin from the room, and we went on to the fortress rampart. For a long time we walked side by side, to and fro, speaking not a word, and with our hands clasped behind our backs. His face expressed nothing out of the common, and that vexed me. Had I been in his place, I should have died of grief. At length he sat down on the ground in the shade and began to draw something in the sand with his stick. More for form's sake than anything, you know, I tried to console him and began to talk. He raised his head and burst into a laugh. At that laugh a cold shudder ran through me. I went away to order a coffin. I confess it was partly to distract my thoughts that I busied myself in that way. I possessed a little piece of Circassian stuff, and I covered the coffin with it, and decked it with some Circassian silver lace, which Grigory Alexandrovitch had bought for Bella herself. Early next day we buried her behind the fortress, by the river, beside the spot where she had sat for the last time. Around her little grave white acacia shrubs and elder trees have now grown up. I should have liked to erect a cross, but that would not have done, you know. After all, she was not a Christian. And what of Pechorin? I asked. Pechorin was ill for a long time, and grew thin, poor fellow, but we never spoke of Bella from that time forth. I saw that it would be disagreeable to him, and what would have been the use. About three months later, he was appointed to the E Regiment, and departed for Georgia. We have never met since. Yet when I come to think of it, Somebody told me not long ago that he had returned to Russia, but it was not in the general orders for the Corps. Besides, to the like of us, news is late in coming. Thereupon, probably to drown sad memories, he launched forth into a lengthy dissertation on the unpleasantness of learning news a year late. I did not interrupt him, nor did I listen. In an hour's time a chance of proceeding on our journey presented itself— the snowstorm subsided, the sky became clear, and we set off. On the way, I involuntarily let the conversation turn on Biela and Pechorin. "'You've not heard of what became of Kazbich?' I asked. "'Kazbich? In truth, I don't know. I have heard that with the shopsugs on our right flank there is a certain Kazbich, a daredevil fellow who rides about at a walking pace, in a red tunic under our bullets.' and bows politely whenever one hums near him, but it can scarcely be the same person. 
In Kobe, Maxim Maximitch and I parted company. I posted on, and he, on account of his heavy luggage, was unable to follow me. We had no expectation of ever meeting again, but meet we did, and if you like, I will tell you how. It is quite a history. You must acknowledge, though, that Maxim Maximitch is a man worthy of all respect. If you admit that, I shall be fully rewarded for my perhaps too lengthy story. End of Book One Reading by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com